Hello and welcome back to The Fall of the Roman Empire. It's Nick Holmes and this is episode 83 called The Siege of Rome. Although Justinian's war against the Ostrogoths would become long and protracted, it began, similar to the Vandal War, with a blitzkrieg-like advance into the Gothic kingdom led by the greatest general of his age, Belisarius. It's ironic that for his campaign against the Goths, who were stronger than the Vandals, he had an army about half the size of the one he'd taken to North Africa, only about 7,500 strong. Procopius tells us it comprised 4,000 Roman regulars, 3,000 Isaurians, 200 Huns and 300 Moors. The other striking feature of this army compared with the one he took to Africa was that only about 1,000 were horsemen, comprising the Huns, Moors and 500 regular Roman horse archers. This meant it didn't have the offensive capacity of Belisarius's African expeditionary force, which had, as you'll recall, 5,000 expert horse archers. In the last episode, we left Belisarius in Syracuse in Sicily, having returned from Carthage, where he put down the army of occupation's unexpected mutiny. When, in the summer of 536, he heard the Gothic king Theodahad had broken off negotiations with Justinian and thrown the main Roman diplomat, Peter the Patrician, into jail, he launched his invasion of Italy by crossing over the Straits of Messina to Reggio in southern Italy. But, to the frustration of the Gothic nobles, Theodahad did nothing other than slowly gather Gothic forces at Ravenna to counter Belisarius' invasion. He wasn't a warrior and preferred reading Plato's philosophy to warfare, which was probably the reason the unfortunate Amala Sunta had judged him more malleable than most Gothic noblemen when she chose him as king. Her mistake had been to underestimate how easily such a weak character like him could be persuaded by the Gothic nobles to have her murdered. But those same nobles were still hesitant about implementing the same fate on him. The result was paralysis at the top of the Gothic chain of command. Belisarius took full advantage of this as he advanced into southern Italy as a liberator, not a conqueror. The towns welcomed him, as I mentioned in the last episode. The Goths lived mainly in northern Italy in the Po Valley, with small garrisons spread throughout the rest of Italy, and very few of them at all were in the south. So it wouldn't have been surprising if many southern Romans had never even seen a Goth. These Italians felt no loyalty to the Goths and were happy to rejoin the Roman Empire. In addition, almost none of the towns had walls, so even if they'd wanted to resist, it would have been difficult. Even some Goths defected, including Theodahad's son-in-law, Ebrimuth. Belisarius celebrated his defection by sending him to Constantinople, where Justinian made him a patrician. With no Gothic resistance, Belisarius' army swept through Calabria and headed north to Naples. Naples was different. It was a large, walled town garrisoned by 800 Goths. The population was in a quandary what to do. Belisarius spoke with an emissary from the city and promised not to harm anyone if they would surrender. He offered the Gothic garrison free passage to the north if they also surrendered. But his peace offer was rejected. The Goths weren't going to budge, and this allowed two of the most prominent and pro-Gothic Neapolitans, Pastor and Asclepiodotus, to persuade the inhabitants to resist. Belisarius had no choice but to attack. He cut the city's aqueduct, but there were plenty of wells inside the city, so this had little effect. He launched several attacks against the city walls, but these were strong, and his soldiers were repulsed with not insignificant casualties. Weeks passed, and Belisarius was getting frustrated, for he didn't want to waste his soldiers' lives, nor did he want to waste time while Theodahad was mustering the main Gothic army. Then Procopius tells us that one of the Azorians, an ordinary soldier, found a tunnel in the aqueduct that led into the city. It was wide enough for a man to pass through except for one point where it was blocked by masonry. 
When the man told his officer about it, they requested to see Belisarius, who was delighted with the information and promised them a significant reward if they could chisel the masonry down to make it passable. He then put a team of 400 soldiers together and in the middle of the night they proceeded down the tunnel holding lanterns. Since there was a tower above the aqueduct, he was worried the Goths manning it might hear the soldiers passing through the aqueduct. So he ordered one of his senior officers, who was a Goth, Bessas, to shout in Gothic to the men in the tower, offering them large bribes if they would surrender. This started a slanging match between the two sets of Goths, and the Romans made their way through the tunnel undetected. But when they were in the city, they ran into problems. First, they weren't sure where they were. Second, they weren't sure how to get down from the aqueduct, which, according to Procopius, was built on very tall arches. They walked along it until the tunnel roof ceased and they could look over the edge. But it was far too steep to jump down without injury, and Procopius vividly describes their finding a very tall olive tree, which an intrepid soldier grasped onto and used to climb down onto the roof of a house. This house belonged to a poor old woman who was terrified at the sight of him, but at sword point she remained quiet as he threw a rope up to his comrades. The rest of the soldiers climbed down the rope and then rushed to the city walls to slaughter the Goths who were slumbering at their posts and to open the city gates. They blew trumpets, which was the prearranged signal for Belisarius's men outside the walls, to storm in. The strategy was completely successful and the Romans seized the city. Belisarius couldn't completely stop the ensuing slaughter and pillage as the soldiers wanted revenge for their comrades killed in front of the walls. He was particularly angry with some of the Huns who killed people taking refuge in a church. But in the early hours of the morning, his officers restored discipline. He was keen to be generous to the Neapolitans to show his army was one of liberation, not occupation. So he released all the inhabitants his soldiers had seized and restored their property. As Procopius put it, quote, Thus it came to pass for the Neapolitans that on that day they both became captives and regained their liberty, end quote. But Procopius tells us the Neapolitans were not so generous with the two civic leaders who'd encouraged them to resist Belisarius. They went to the house of one, Asclepiodotus, and, quote, killed him and tore his body into small bits, end quote. The other man, Pastor, died of apoplexy when he saw the city fall, but the citizens took his body and impaled it in the main square. Meanwhile, back in Ravenna, the news of the fall of Naples was too much for the Gothic nobility as they watched the Odahad dither indecisively. They gathered at Regatta outside Ravenna and proclaimed a new king, Wittigis, who had won renown as a warrior when Theodoric was fighting the Gepids. On hearing this, the Odahad fled to Ravenna, but according to Procopius, Wittigis sent a young Goth called Optaris after him, who bore the Odahad a grudge since he'd prevented him from marrying a beautiful young heiress who was also in love with him. Procopius says the king had prevented the love match to accept a bribe to betroth the woman to another man. Needless to say, Optaris rode night and day until he found Theodahad and, quote, slew him like a victim for sacrifice, end quote. Unlike Theodahad, Wittigis flew into action. He marched down to Rome with 4,000 men and garrisoned the city before returning to Ravenna with several senators in tow for good behaviour to organise the main Gothic army and to negotiate an alliance with the Franks by giving them Gothic territory in southern Gaul. He also married Amalasunta's daughter, Matasunta, to establish a link with Theodoric's family, although Procopius tells us she was not exactly a willing partner. But if Wittigis was busy, 
Belisarius was busier. In forced marches, he rushed his small army towards Rome along the Via Appia, the ancient Roman road built over 900 years before in the early years of the Roman Republic, connecting Rome with southern Italy. Procopius provides a fascinating description of how this road had survived the trials of time and was still in pristine condition with the carefully laid stones providing a broad, perfectly flat surface to move on. The Roman Senate sent Belisarius emissaries inviting him into the city and promising to cooperate, unlike the Neapolitans. The 4,000-strong Gothic garrison wondered what to do. Should they try to hold out with the city's inhabitants hostile to them and liable to open the gates at any time? The Gothic commander Luderis decided not to. On the 9th of December, 536, the Goths marched out of the northern city gate called Flaminia, while Belisarius marched unopposed into the southern gate called Asinaria. Luderis separated himself from his troops and surrendered to Belisarius, fearful he would be executed for cowardice if he stayed with the Goths. Belisarius treated him honourably and sent him to Justinian, carrying with him the keys to the city. So, in this way, Procopius tells us, after 60 years since the official end of the Western Roman Empire in 476, Rome, quote, again became subject to the Romans, end quote. Belisarius had yet again achieved the impossible. He'd reconquered Rome with a ridiculously small army and with almost no casualties. He was repeating the success of his victory in North Africa, but with one major difference. He hadn't defeated the Goths in battle. And news soon arrived that the main Gothic army, 150,000 strong according to Procopius, which was a wild exaggeration, and in reality it probably numbered 20 to 30 thousand against Belisarius's six thousand was now ready to march from Ravenna to meet him in battle. What should Belisarius do? He was vastly outnumbered. He had some reliable heavy infantry, but he didn't have the quantity of Roman horse archers that had brought him victory in Africa, so he couldn't meet the Goths in a pitched battle as he'd done with the Vandals. He'd already sent messages to Justinian begging for reinforcements, and the emperor had spent the last quarter of 536 mobilising all the troops he could spare from the eastern and Danube fronts, but he had to transport them to Italy, and since it was midwinter, the weather made that difficult. An advance guard of 1,600 elite horse archers, commanded by Martinus and Valerian, had sailed from the east to Italy in late 536, but bad weather in Greece had held them up, and it would be weeks or possibly months before they arrived, and by then, the Gothic army would be at Rome. Despite his lack of reinforcements, Belisarius chose to defend the city. It was one of the most courageous decisions of his life, for he had barely enough men to man the 12 miles long city walls that were also crumbling in places, and he had no access to the sea to get provisions or reinforcements. Historical precedent was hardly reassuring, since Rome had easily fallen to Alaric the Goth a century and a quarter before. Although the city's inhabitants had welcomed him, they were now distraught since they knew a siege would cause considerable hardship and suffering for them, and they begged him to leave. But Belisarius responded by setting them to work repairing the city's walls, collecting provisions from the countryside and filling the city's water systems. He also arranged for a fleet of ships with grain to come from Sicily to provision the city. Meanwhile, his troops seized the towns north of Rome, which willingly joined the Eastern Roman cause. Almost all the towns in southern Italy also declared for Justinian. The news that his kingdom was slipping away from him encouraged Wittigis to march post-haste down the Via Flaminia, the ancient road that led from Rimini to Rome. When he heard Belisarius only had 6,000 men, he assumed he would withdraw from Rome. 
But Procopius says he met a priest coming from Rome who told him that Belisarius did not know what the word retreat meant. The Gothic army reached the Milvian Bridge on the River Tiber, where the Emperor Constantine had famously defeated Maxentius over 200 years before, and so, legend says, converted to Christianity in thanks for his victory. Belisarius's soldiers were manning the tower guarding the bridge, but when they saw the size of the Gothic host, they fled south in panic. This caused Belisarius a problem, since he brought up all his cavalry to stop the Goths from crossing. When they arrived, they found the Goths had already crossed the Tiber. A furious battle ensued. Procopius says Belisarius fought in the front line, killing Goths with his own sword. The Goths fled, but returned with thousands of infantry. This time the Romans had to retreat, but the soldiers and civilians along the city walls wouldn't let them in, so afraid were they that the Goths would just push their way inside. Belisarius made a last furious charge against the enemy, pushing them back sufficiently for the city gates to be opened and to let him and his men back in. It was now dark, and Belisarius ordered the citizens to light flaming torches and line the walls in case the Goths tried a surprise attack. Exhausted, he and his men settled down to rest. That was only the first day of the Siege of Rome. It would last for almost a year. Procopius provides us with a vivid eyewitness account of the months that followed, making it the most notable record of any siege in late antiquity, and one worth reading for its excitement value alone. When Wittigis arrived with his entire army, the first thing he did was to cut the aqueducts that fed water into Rome. Belisarius responded by filling them with masonry to prevent their being used as a route into the city, just as he himself had done so successfully in Naples. Wittigis then decided on a full-scale assault of the city, but to do this he needed siege engines. So the Goths spent weeks building a vast array of siege towers. Meanwhile, Belisarius was busy making wall artillery to fire at the Goths. The Roman specialities were ballistae, a sort of giant crossbow with a large arrow or bolt which could be fired with enormous force, and onagers, giant slings which threw rocks at the enemy. Finally, the Gothic assault took place. Procopius says when Belisarius saw the Gothic siege towers rumbling towards the walls, he burst out laughing, for they were all being dragged by oxen. Belisarius put an arrow to his bow and waited before giving the signal to shoot. When the oxen were within range, flurries of arrows shot out from the walls, killing all the unfortunate animals and many of the Goths. Procopius's description reminds me of the film Gladiator when Russell Crowe famously said, unleash hell as a torrent of Roman arrows showered on the barbarians. It must have been pretty much the same as the Romans unleashed a storm of arrows and ballista bolts against the oncoming Goths, who weren't used to siege warfare, and advanced right up to the walls with ladders, leaving their siege engines stranded, surrounded by dead oxen. The result was an unmitigated slaughter. Countless Goths were shot down in front of the walls, with Belisarius, who was himself an expert archer, picking off dozens of them, according to Procopius, who also describes a ballista bolt being fired at a Goth who tried to shoot back at the Romans from behind the cover of a tree. Quote, Passing through the breastplate and the body of the man, the arrow sank more than half its length into the tree he was beside, pinning him to the spot where it entered the tree and suspending his corpse there. End quote. Procopius says the Goths were so terrified by this spectacle they retreated from that section of the walls. Fierce fighting raged along the walls all day, nowhere could the Goths break through? 
Belisarius wasn't content with shooting them down, but rushed from gate to gate, giving orders to the defenders to sally out and burn the siege engines whenever he saw an opportunity. Soon the city was encircled with smoke rising from the smouldering wrecks. Meanwhile, there was fierce fighting at Hadrian's Mausoleum, the modern Castel San Angelo, which in the 3rd century had been incorporated into the city walls by the Emperor Aurelian. Procopius describes how the defenders pushed the ancient statues on the top of this monument, quote, representing men and horses wonderfully made, end quote, over the edge to crash onto the Goths below. By the end of the day, Procopius says 30,000 Goths lay dead in front of the walls. Undoubtedly a huge exaggeration and it's probably more likely around 10% of that number lost their lives. The Romans lined the walls, lighting the darkness with their torches, wildly singing victory songs and applauding Belisarius. On the Gothic side... The only sounds were the screams of the wounded and the laments for the dead. It was one of Belisarius's finest moments. He'd stopped the Gothic army in its tracks. Wittigis was stunned at the ferocity of the Roman defence, but he didn't give up. If he couldn't storm the city, he'd starve it out. The Goths made sure no supplies reached the city, especially by sea, as they occupied Rome's chief port, Portus, which had long replaced Ostia. Belisarius sent urgent messages to Justinian, begging for reinforcements. He also ordered all the women, children and old men south to Naples. Procopius says they could escape at night because the Goths couldn't patrol the entire circuit of the city walls, they were so large, and were also afraid of going out in small patrol groups since they were frightened of the groups of Berbers Belisarius would send outside the city walls at night. These fierce North African tribesmen were adept at hiding and then jumping out and killing Gothic patrols. He recruited all the younger men in the city to join the army and guard the walls. He also detected a possible traitor in Pope Silverius, who was rumoured to be hoping to open negotiations of his own with the Goths, and sent him to Greece, replacing him with a new and more subservient Pope Vigilius. But what really made the difference happened finally in early April 537, when the first of Justinian's reinforcements arrived. 1,600 horsemen, mainly Huns, with some Roman regulars, under the command of Martinus and Valerian, joined the defenders. This transformed Belisarius's tactical options. He could now launch sorties through the city gates against the Goths. These were very successful since the Roman and Hunnic horse archers would suddenly appear, pepper the Goths with arrows and disappear. The Roman advantage was entirely because of their horse archery, as Procopius yet again emphasised, quote, And the difference was this, that practically all the Romans and their allies, the Huns, are good mounted archers. But this fighting style was not practised among the Goths, whose horsemen are accustomed to use only spears and swords, while their archers enter battle on foot and are shielded by their infantry, end quote. But if Belisarius was winning at hit-and-run tactics, his army wasn't yet strong enough to defeat the Goths in a decisive battle. However, the starving city inhabitants persuaded him to try this, and he led all the cavalry out, supported by a phalanx of infantry made up of the citizen militia. It wasn't a good idea. In the ensuing battle, the citizens fled, and Belisarius's horsemen had to retreat into the city. It was still a deadlock, and food became so short that plague broke out in the city. In desperation, the inhabitants began to revive pagan traditions. For example, Procopius tells us that the bronze doors of the Temple of Janus in the Forum were left open, reviving the pagan tradition that they should always be left open when Rome was at war. 
But in the fall of 537, everything changed. Procopius tells us Belisarius had sent him and his own wife Antonina, who was with Belisarius throughout his African and Italian campaigns, to Naples to secure provisions for the city, when, at long last, Justinian's promised reinforcements arrived. Ships had landed in southern Italy with 3,000 Isaurian infantry, 800 cavalry from the Thracian field army and 1,500 horsemen from the eastern field army. At a stroke, Belisarius's army was almost doubled and he had well over 2,000 expert horse archers. This was effectively the end of the siege of Rome. For Wittigis saw he had no chance now of taking the city and asked for peace talks. He proposed the partition of Italy. The Romans would keep all their conquests, i.e. Rome, Naples and southern Italy, while the Goths kept the rest. A three-month armistice was agreed. Gothic ambassadors left for Constantinople to discuss peace terms with Justinian. They thought the war was over. But it wasn't. In the early spring of 538, Wittigis broke the truce with a surprise attack on Rome through the aqueducts and an assault on the walls. But it was a feeble attempt compared to the great assault he launched a year before with his siege engines. Belisarius easily defeated it. Now it was his turn. He unleashed his horse archers and the Gothic army poured back north towards Ravenna, harried by the Romans. Belisarius's defence of Rome was one of his greatest victories. With an army the fraction of the size of the Goths, he'd held on to the city and then sent them fleeing. Wittigis was on the run, and Belisarius's next objective was the complete defeat of the Goths. And that ends this episode. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. And in the next episode, which I'm sorry will be in two weeks' time on the 13th of April because of holidays, we'll continue with the amazing story of Justinian Belisarius and the Age of Reconquest. And in the meantime, if you like the podcast, please leave a review and recommend it to a friend. And of course, do also check out my website, nickholmesauthor.com, link in the show notes, to find maps, blogs, and a free email book. And don't forget to take a look at my latest book, Rome and Attila. Again, link in the show notes. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Bye.